I didn't know if he did homecoming in the spring, but he said that's what his tradition was. Well, they grew up on that, so they invited him back, so he's there today. So uh, I guess you're stuck with me. But uh, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited for what God has put on my heart. And I want just to encourage you, though, to make sure you come back next week so you can hear Chris, who does a tremendous job for us as our senior minister, and make sure you come back and uh, hear Chris preach as well. In fact, next Sunday, I think, is you Sunday, so you'll get to hear our illustrious youth minister speak next week. So come out and support all that as well. So really excited about that. And as you see, it, uh, we've been talking about this morning, you know, God's placed in my heart today to talk about faith. And, you know, faith is such a broad topic, he's kind of like, well, what in the world are you going to talk about on faith? And you just have to kind of get in my mind a little bit what's going on over the last six months, and I'll talk about it more in, in a minute. But if you think about it, every person, whether you're a believer or not, has some element of faith. When you got in the car this morning to come here, did you concern yourself at all about the people that were 10 foot away in the other lane facing you? No. You didn't really think about it, did you? Why? Because you have faith that those people were not going to come across running into you, right? And also, how many of you ever been on an airplane? When you stepped on that airplane that weighs a couple hundred thousand pounds, did you concern yourself about whether you know, maybe you did, maybe you can sweat the bullets, but you got on a plane that has no business staying in the air, right? So you got to have a certain amount of faith, and that's true in all kinds of things in life. And in, and in faith, has expressed itself uh, amongst Christians in a lot of different ways. And I just had to tell you this story about uh, Sister Mary. Sister Mary was this uh, Christian lady, that she was one that was real extrovert. She loved to be loud and whatever. And so every morning when she got up, she'd go out on her front porch. And she'd just say, praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord God. You're so good. And she did that every morning very loudly. Unfortunately, though, her neighbor was an atheist. And he got really annoyed at her saying that all the time. And he kept yelling out to her and said, no, God's dead. There is no such thing as God. And so every day she'd come out and say a little bit loud. And so finally as time went on and inflation came and money got tight, her sister Mary didn't have enough money for groceries. So she went out on the porch one morning and she said, praise God, praise the Lord. God, I need groceries. I know you'll provide. Praise the Lord. And so she went on back in the house and he said, aha, I got it now. So he went to the grocery store that night and bought a bag of groceries. He took the groceries early before morning and he put it on the porch. So when sister Mary came out, she said, oh, praise God, praise God, you have provided me groceries. Man jumped out from the bush. He was hiding his weight. He said, aha, I got you. I told you there was no God. I bought those groceries. Told you there was no God. Without missing a beat, so Mary jumped up and said, praise God, praise God, you provided me groceries and you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> but you know, even in most churches and amongst different people that believe different ways, they have tenets of faith. And we express ourselves a lot of times in, in church and through things and based on our faith and based on our beliefs and stuff. And, and I, I, I just, I'd be probably missed not to tell you this story because there was this beautiful city down in the south where in this suburb there was a street that was called Church Street. And it was called that because there were five churches lined up together and in one Jewish synagogue. And it was a beautiful place full of beautiful trees and all these things, but they all had a common problem. And the common problem was there was just, just a tremendous infestation, if you will, like a plague of squirrels. And these squirrels were like something out of the Ten Commandments. You know, they were like a plague. They were, just, they were mean, they were horrible, they were everything. And they would get together and they would talk, the leaders of these six places, they would come together and talk over their thing. They got talking about the squirrels one day. And they said, well, you know what, we're going to do. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's go back and pray about it and express our faith and get with our people and let's figure out what we're going to do about these squirrels, and we'll come back a year from now, and we'll figure out who had the best plan. <clears throat> so they did that, and they came back a year over, and they started out, the very first church was the Presbyterian Church, and they said, well, what did y'all do? And they said, well, we figured it was preordained that the squirrels should stay here, so we just let it. So what happened? They said, well, the squirrels took over. They just ran all over the church. Okay. So the second one was the Baptist Church. They said, well, what did y'all do? They said, well, you know, we had this beautiful baptistry, and so what we decided was to put a slide on it. And we figured those rascals would come on and get on that thing and slide on down and they would just drown in the bathroom. And they say, well, what happened? Well, come to find out, the squirrels love the water. And after a couple of months, we had twice as many squirrels as we had. So that didn't work out. So they went to the third church, and they were Lutheran church. And they said, well, what did y'all do? They said, well, we just couldn't put ourselves to do any harm. So we got a bunch of live traps. We trapped all of the squirrels, and we took them next door to the Baptist church. And all of a sudden, they all over there, but 
what happened? He said, well, the Baptist took the water slide down and all of them came back. He <laughs> said, that is y'all. So then he went to the Episcopalian church, the next church. They said, well, what did y'all do? He said, well, we decided we put around the church these pans of, of whiskey out and we would let them come and, and that they would partake and that we hoped that maybe they'd get, you know, kind of drunk and leave the scene or whatever or maybe die of alcohol poisoning. They said, well, what happened? Well, we found out that drunk squirrels were twice as mean as sober shrimps. <laughs> so then he went to the Church of Christ. He was next there. And they said, well, what did y'all do? And they said, well, you know, we believed in the Word and we preached the Word to them and we baptized all of them. They said, what happened? They said, they just showed up on Easter and Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and then they went to the Jewish rabbi and they said, well, what did y'all do? And he said, well, we followed the law. He said, and after we circumcised the first squirrel, we've never seen another one. <laughs> So, you know, there was all kinds of things we can talk about faith this morning, but I want to share with you my God from my heart. And that's just very much. You have to go, if you want to just allow me today to do something a little different. I want to talk about my journey. And my journey started about in August, sometime back in August. And I was beginning to look for some materials I taught in my Sunday school class. And, and uh, I want to encourage you right now, if you're an adult in here, if you have kids, if you're not going to a Sunday school class, you really should be. We have a lot of fun, a lot of, it's informal. A lot of things you can talk about, a lot of growth in our faith. So I really want to encourage you to come and be part of Sunday school. But I was praying about my Sunday school class, and um, I come across this old lesson I'd done like 20 years ago, and it was on faith. And I said, well, you know, I love that passage of Scripture that it was talking about, and I think I'm going to dive into that. And um, looked at the material, and I said, okay, that's going to be about two, three weeks of material. Well, I started that in sometime first of September, and six months later, I finished. <laughs> I want to tell you that God, as He began, as I began to delve into what faith was, all my life I grew up in the church. And I think there's just a handful of us that have been here our whole life. And I grew up here in this church, and I had wonderful teachers and preachers and ministers and people that taught me a lot of things. And, and I've always had a real understanding of what faith was, I thought. And as I began to delve in, God was like that little sailboat I was in. And as He began to blow, as the Spirit began to blow, He took me to here and to here and to here and all over the places. And those in the class know we took a long journey to study of faith. And that's this morning what I want to talk to you about is what I learned in that six months. And I'll do it in a very short time. But if you haven't listened to me before and preached when I preached, and I started this 18 years ago and I was doing a lot of preaching, but I believe in this word. I believe this is what we need as a church. I believe this is what the world needs. I believe our culture will only be influenced and changed when we believe and know what the Word is. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, if you have it on your phone, if you will, if you will hold this up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. God's Holy Word. God's Holy Word. And I believe, believe. it will change my life. Change my those life. I share. Those I share. share. Let's pray. Father God, we are here now at this point in time. God, you have prepared this message. You have written on my heart. God, I know with all my heart there are things about faith that we need to dig into a little bit deeper. God, I know as our culture, the world collapses around us, the immorality, the evil, Father, I know how important it's going to be for your people to hold on to faith, to know what the faith is, how to grow in our faith. So, Father, I pray that there won't be a word out of my mouth today that's mine. I pray, God, be all you. Lord, just we thank you for your presence. I pray, Father, for the word that comes from your scriptures that will change our hearts and our lives, and change our future this very day. Thank you, Father. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, starting down this journey, I began to look at scriptures, and I began to go back, and God kept speaking to my heart and talking to me about things of faith that I think you wanted obviously wanted me to know and to remember. And I remember some scriptures and things from the past that I taught in a, a class on the end times. But there was one passage of scripture in particular that really kind of shocked me, kind of got my attention. And it comes from Luke, the 18th chapter, in the 8th verse. And Jesus was talking about this heathen judge that didn't want to give, that had no care, no fear of God, no fear of man. And this widow was asking for protection. And right in the middle of all this, at the conclusion of this, the last part of that, verse 18, Jesus says this, However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? 
When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? And that troubled my spirit. That troubled my heart. Because I thought about Jesus and, and being Jesus, and He's talking about His return, and He's asking the question, and He's relating it back because this widow, this person that later was asking for things, she kept pounding and pounding on this judge. And I believe He was referring to the fact that she wouldn't give up. She wouldn't let go. And this unrighteous judge finally relented. And then Jesus is reflecting on this story He's telling, and He says, when the Son of Man returns... Will he find faith? And I thought, oh my goodness. Does that apply to me? Why should I be concerned? Should I be concerned about this? What is it that Jesus is talking about? I, I can almost sense the sadness in his voice. As he's looking and, and looking for the faith of people as children of faith that, that he has died on the cross for. And he's asking the question, will I find any faith? And so as I began to concentrate and focus on that scripture. God called me back to some scriptures that from my previous lessons on end times, and then it just was shocked at how all this had tied in. And I wanted to listen to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the first verse. This is Paul writing to Timothy, and I want you to listen how concrete this is. He said, But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. <clears throat> Listen again to this word. The Spirit explicitly says, there is no question, there is no doubt, there is not a gray area, The Paul says in writing a that the Holy Spirit explicitly says that some will fall away from the faith. I don't know if that sobers you up, but it does me. Because I consider myself to be part of a person of faith. But he's saying in the times that are coming that there are going to be people that are going to fall away from the faith. And so then I remember back in 2 Thessalonians when, when Paul <laughs> arrived at the Thessalonian church and he was talking about Jesus coming back and he was also talking about the Antichrist and the, the son of perdition that was going to come on the scene prior to his coming. And you find this scripture in 2 Thessalonians um, 2. I got my papers being stepped having glasses. He says, Now, we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the come of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together in Him, that you may not be shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as it is from us to the effect that the Lord has come. No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness appears. He says, none of these things are going to happen until the apostasy happens first. Now, what's the apostasy? The apostasy simply means the falling away of faith, people of faith. And as I begin to look and think about our culture and where we are today, and I begin to think about teachings of, by demons and doctrines and things, and I begin to think about how watered down the gospel has become in so many places, and how so many people have begun to accept the lie as the truth, and the truth has become a lie. And I'm beginning to question myself, well then, hey, are we already walking in a time of falling away? And I think we probably are. But what is that about for us? What is, what is it God is trying to teach me about this? And so I begin to ask myself, well, what does this look like, this falling away? And then I remember 2 Timothy 4, chapter, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So as I got to be more concerned again, as I see some of those things happening, that this is what falling away is when people believe, but begin to believe false teachings of things. And so I got asking the Lord as I begin to, to really get on my knees and pray and start searching the scriptures about this subject of faith. I said, obviously this is important. Because we're all saying we're people of faith. So what does it mean to me to say I'm a man of faith or you to say you're a man or woman of faith? What does it mean? Because there's warnings to us about things that are going to happen in time. So if our faith is not what it is supposed to be, there's a real good chance that we're going to be deceived. A real good chance. And so I got delving into it and I started assessing and said, okay God, I want to start going back to my room and say, okay, well, what is faith? And the first thing that came to me was that when people come down this aisle to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord, what's the first thing we ask? What is it we ask them to confession? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of the living God, right? So I know that faith has to do with belief, right? We have to believe. We hear the gospel message and we believe and we want to accept Christ as our Savior. So I knew that belief was part of it. And I began to think about all the things that God talked about and Jesus talked about in the scriptures and he talked to people and they ask about belief and they say belief. And I said, okay, I'm getting to this. I know that faith has got to do with belief. And then the Spirit took me to James 2.19. And James 2.19 kind of slapped me in my face to be reminded of this. And James 2.19, is it up there? Says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Whoa, wait a minute. Demons believe? They do, don't they? Demons believe. Well, then if demons believe, then is faith just about belief? I had a question in that. I said, well, if demons believe, we're told in the scriptures they believe, okay, then faith requires belief. But then it must be more than just belief. And so then I remembered and called back to my scriptures about what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. And I began to really hone in to what he was trying to get my attention on. And we see this in, in the seventh uh, chapter of uh, Matthew. And this is what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, part of that sermon. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name cast out demons, and you perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who are practicing lawlessness. I said, wait a minute. These people knew Jesus. They called him Lord. And so as I began to really... He didn't dig into that. I began to realize that there were people that were doing great things. They were casting out demons. They were doing miracles. They were prophesying. They were doing all these things and they called Him Lord so they knew Him. They believed Him. But Jesus' response is, you know, every you work as a lawlessness. I don't know you. Depart from And so then at that point it became very clear to me that faith had to entail more than just belief. And it had to entail something I knew that had to do with our heart. And we knew from James, the book of James, James tells us very clearly there that faith without works is dead. But wait a minute. These people Jesus talked about were doing works. Right? They were doing works. They were casting out demons. They were doing miracles. They were prophesying. They were doing all these things. So they were doing works. So there's something that's got to be missing here. Because faith and jobs involves belief, and it also involves doing some kind of works. But then again, we see Jesus saying, get away from me, I don't know you. And they were doing all these crazy, wonderful things, you would say. So as I began digging in, I went back to the 11th chapter of, of Hebrews, and I really began to, to question and, and look and see. And, and of course, the definition of faith we have in Hebrews 11.1. 1, and Hebrews 11.1 1, uh, says, well... Oh, there it is. Now, faith is the certainty of things hoped for and proof of things not seen. Faith is the certainty of things hoped for and a proof of things not seen. That certainly involves belief as well. But I knew that as you search the Hebrews 11 chapter, there's all these wonderful examples of people of faith. And so I knew that the answer to what God was trying to teach me was to find in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And I really encourage you to take the time to read the 11th chapter and look at everyone that's mentioned there and go back in the Old Testament and follow it out and you can begin to see what Jesus was given to teach me about faith. And so as I looked at those examples there, I went down and saw, obviously, that the one that's given the most credit for faith is, of course, Abraham. And I thought about all the things that Abraham did and why he was credited him as righteousness for all the things that he had done. So I decided to dig into part of what Abraham does to find out, okay, God, what is it that you're trying to get me to learn about faith that involves more than belief and more than works? So we turn to Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and we'll pick up the, the story about him offering Isaac to be, to give, as God tells him, to give him as a sacrifice. We'll, just, we'll skip around a little bit here, but the first two verses of the 22nd chapter says this. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, 
And he said, Here I am. <laughs> then he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go into the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I'll tell you. And then in verse 6, he says, And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he laid it in his son Isaac, and he took his hand in the fire of the knife, and so the two of them walked together. And Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look at the fire and the wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two walked on. And then they came to the place in which God told him, and Abraham built the altar there, and arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not reach out your hand against the boy, and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place that the Lord provide, as it said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. And as I begin to dig in and pray about this passage of Scripture, very familiar to us. And I began to pray, what are the elements of faith? What is it that Abraham taught us about faith? And first of all, we know that Abraham believed. He absolutely believed. He responded when God called and said, Here I am. Because he knew the voice of God. So he knew God. And he responded and said, Here I am. And we also know that he responded because he did what God called him to do. He did every step. He took his son. They went on a trip. He got there. The son said, Hey, Dad, where's this sacrifice? God will provide. He put the son on the altar, Isaac on the altar, and had the knife in the air, and he was ready to slay his son. The angel called out to him. And as God provided the ram for him, I went back and I got thinking, what is that middle part that connects belief and response? And then it became very obvious and clear to me what God was trying to say. You see, true faith involves an intellectual belief, an emotional trust, and an obedient response. And that middle part, you see, ties in the two. Without the middle, there cannot be the other two. Without the surrender, without the volitional giving up of our will to God, our responses and the works that will be due will be like the ones Jesus talked about, the ones casting out demons that he said he didn't know. Because you see, true faith comes from my total surrender of myself to God. The trust that I believe that God is who he is. It's great to say I believe in God. It's great to say I believe in Jesus. But do we trust him with everything of our life? Do we lay our life down and we do we? Make everything available to God and say, God, if you will just use me. God, I am here for you. I want to do what you want me to do. And as God gives us instructions, as he always does and places us and gives us spiritual gifts and talents to use the ministry, then he will show us the works that he wants done. But you see that middle part is so important because it connects and brings it all together. We have to be willing to give up ourselves to God. And of course, Satan knows all these things, and he, what he does, he goes about everything he can do to distract God's people. He wants us to give us all these fun things to do, all the things that we got to do, we want to do, and all of a sudden, what God wants is not all that important. Yeah, I believe. And yeah, I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to do that. But if we're not doing it because God completely controls our heart and our life, and that it is His, then it's going to be works that be burned up in the fire, as Paul wrote the Corinthians. Third chapter, First Corinthians. He said, "Your works will be tested with fire, and not the truth from faith. They're going to be burned up." And I began to think in my own life, in the life, of so many times the things that we have to do is, is trying to decipher what is really God's will for me. What what is it that God wants from me? And you know, it's a very simple thing. God loves us. God gave Jesus His only Son, everything to Him for you and I. And yet, so many times, we think that God doesn't need all of us. So we only give Him bits and pieces. But what God has said in His Word is, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. 
as we read this morning in our call to worship. We are the people. And well, by being God's people, He wants us to know that this walk that we have to make in this journey can only be walked out in faith. And faith has to require belief. It has to be required to surrender of our will to Him and then it has to be an obedient response. Because without all three ingredients, we're just going to travel through life and bounce around like a pinball machine. With no distraction. That's why you know, Paul told the Ephesians that we can't be in our faith like that is tossed to and fro by every way. That's why so many Christians struggle so hard. It's because we're always trying to do things in our own strength. We're always trying to make our own decisions. We don't put God first in everything and we bounce and bounce and bounce and we go through one thing and one crisis after another. But God offers us freedom from everything in this life, no matter what we struggle with. Everybody in here at some point in your life have moments and times that we struggle with issues. And it's so easy to give up because our faith is not deep enough. Our faith has not involved that giving up of ourselves to Him. We believe, yes, you wouldn't be sitting here this morning if you didn't believe. And sometimes we'll occasionally do ministry work. But are we doing the things for God because we know that it pleases Him? That He is first place in our life. I said in Sunday school class this morning, too many times that we look at our life as this big, long smorgasbord. And we've got all these things on this board. We've got jobs, family, we've got fun things. We like to go to ball games. We like to do all these things we like to do. And if somewhere along this board, there's God. And so we think that God is just on our smorgasbord and we can pull him off the shelf whenever we need him or wherever we want to think. But it's just not the way it works. I'm telling you that from my study of God's Word, that when the end times come and they are here, and I believe they're coming and they're here, there are going to be times and things that you will be tested with, and if you don't strong have strong faith, you're going to fall away. I will fall away. When you look at Revelation, and whether you believe the literal interpretation or not, I tend to believe that. When you look at the, when the Antichrist comes and the one world ruler up, he says, I'm not going to let you buy or sell unless you get my mark on your hand and your forehead. And if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to buy it. Now, how many are you going to let your children starve? How deep is your faith? Are you going to trust God that He's going to deliver you? Are you going to trust God that your place where you go to heaven to be with Him is a million times better than getting some, some drops of food? Is your faith deep enough? Because the Word says that some are going to fall away. And we have to understand what's going to happen. We have to trust God for everything and know that God loves us dearly. And He's prepared that place for us and no matter what we might face, and listen folks, it's coming fastly in our culture and our society today. If you believe truth, and God's Word is truth, Amen. and if you do not believe this, you are going to face persecution. <laughs> You're going to be called a hater. You're going to be called racist. You're going to be called all these things because you say what God's Word says. And if you're going to stand with Christ, Paul wrote Timothy the same thing, told him. He says, look, I'm not, you, know, you will face persecutions. We've had it amazingly easy in our life in this country. When you look at all the cultures in the world for the last 2,000 years, most people are so many people that have been martyred and killed and it's going on in the world today. We've been blessed. And the point that God has placed in my heart about understanding about faith is this. Walking with Jesus in faith is a joyous, joyous thing. Most of the struggles that we face is because we're always fighting with God. We have just enough of the Holy Spirit that He convicts us and we get pulled, but ultimately most of the time our flesh wins and we go do what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do. But when we go in all the way, we jump in both feet, when we just totally say, hey, I'm going all the way to you, Christ. You're going to be my friend. You're going to be everything to me. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to live my life in faith. And I don't care what I'm faced with in life. I'm going to have joy. And I'm going to have peace because Jesus is the king of my life. Amen. And I'm telling you right then, your life will be opened up like you've never seen. The devil throws all kinds of things to take our way of faith. He throws everything into one of the things he used the most is just hardness of heart. That we don't let God fertilize and cultivate in whatever heart to allow his spirit to grow into. 
We get anxious. We get worried. We get all these things away. They just counteract our faith. They, they tear down our faith as much as we grow. But the real good news I want to, to, to just tell you that is God desires a personal, close relationship with you. He loves us more than we can possibly love ourselves. I know most of you have got children and grandkids. You just can't imagine anybody loving your children as much as you love your own. And I can just tell you that God loves you more than you can possibly love your spouse or your child. His love is so real and so pure. And He wants that relationship. And what I found in my studies on all this was a very easy thing. It sounds easy. It's hard to do. But I went back and I looked at some, some great people in the Bible and how they built their relationship with God. And you may say, maybe the Spirit's convicted that you need to be better in your faith. And I can tell you what I learned in looking at some examples. I know in Exodus, I think it's 3, 4, God was in the burning bush. And as the bush was burning, Moses came to the bush. And as he was turning away, God called Moses from the bush. And Moses said, Here I am. Here I am. And the story we just read with Abraham, as God called from heaven, we see Abraham say, here I am. Here I am. And when the angel called him, he said, here I am. And when Isaiah was in the vision of the presence of God, and God said, who will I send? Isaiah said, here I am. You see, to grow in our faith, it all starts with saying to God, here I am. He knows we're not perfect. He knows that our faith needs to grow. Nobody ever reaches perfected head faith in this life. But we always continue to strive in what God is wanting us to do. Just make ourselves available to Him. His Word will soothe our soul. His Word will heal our bones. His Word will free us from everything. But we have to understand we have to be available and desire it. God's Word says in Hebrews 11, 6 as well, He talks about that those that seek Him, that those that come in faith, and those that seek Him will be rewarded. In Proverbs 8 chapter, we see the same thing. God says, I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek me will find me. We see it in 2 Chronicles 28 9, we see the same thing. If those that love me, those that come after me, I will let them find you. Jesus stands at the door in Revelation 3, and He says He knocks. He's standing at the door and knocking because He wants to come in and dine with us. He wants to be our best, best, best friend. Not only our Lord and our Savior, but He wants to be that connection between Him and the Father. And that's why, as His children today, as we stand, as we do the things that we do in our life, and we walk His life out, we have the confidence to know that Jesus, the Son of God, is our High Priest, is sitting beside the Father. And that Jesus, as He walked through His life, Fully man and fully God, he experienced every temptation that you and I ever face. And of course, he had no sin, but guess what he knows? He knows what it's like. And so we can have that peace, that faith, that understanding that Jesus is interceding for us from a, to a Father that loves us. And I'm telling you, it's so much easier to go through life, walking out a life of faith. Some of you today are facing with different things. We may have health issues. We may have, we may have relationship issues. We may have things that we just think is so overwhelming to us. We may be fighting different uh, things in our life that just overwhelm us. And we just wonder sometimes from day to day, how in the world am I ever going to get through this? It's a patent answer in the church. We say, thank you. You see, we have this catchphrase that we all love to use. And every time we do anything, He'll say, God's got it. Right? Yes. God's got it. The real question is, who's got you? Have you give yourself to Jesus? Have you give yourself to God for you? Are you walking out that life of faith? When you believe, you surrendered your life, you emotionally trust God, no matter what you can understand it, no matter if you get don't know what test results are going to be or whatever might be coming your way. It's okay. Because God has got your heart now. And you believe and you walk that out. And you know what our response is? 
God, you've given me gifts, you've given me talents. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to walk out my faith in a tangible way and do those things you call me to do because there's nothing more important than serving the God that loved me so much and saved me. So this morning, as we wrap this up, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you have never named Jesus as your Lord, the first step in your step and walk of faith is to accept Christ as your Savior. It's to name Him as Lord and be baptized into Christ. If you've been a Christian for a while and you know that you've been weighed by the world, you can make a recommitment where you sit and you can come down and rededicate your life that way. Whatever decision you need to make, Now's the time to let God to move in your heart. And let's be more men and women of true faith that God's called us to be. Come as you stand.